Li Sheng, welcome to the show. Good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, John. How's it going? Man, going, going pretty well here out of Nashville. Or are you uh, calling, calling out of Beijing today? Yeah, I'm in Shanghai, actually. So the, right. the Cobalt Vault team is in Shanghai. And uh, the other stuff of Cobalt is in Beijing. Perfect, perfect. Uh, well, good mm -hmm. stuff. Well, well uh, uh, for those who aren't quite familiar with, with you yet personally, can you give us kind of a, uh, a brief uh, intro into your background, uh, how you got into Bitcoin and ended up with, with uh, Kobo in the first place? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Li Xin, uh, the head of hardware from Kobo. Uh, uh, I think the first question is how I get into Bitcoin, right? So uh, I think it's back to 2009. Uh, late 2009, around Christmas, uh, because I graduated from my university in 2010. So in late 2009, that was our like job hunting season. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I spent like 10 hours every day on internet searching for like job uh, opportunities and also uh -huh. doing online interviews. And uh, I still remember Middle of the that financial at that crisis. Time. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. And uh, at that time, I'm a super heavy user of Google Reader. I'm not sure if you know Google Reader. It's mm -hmm. a ISS subscriber. And so you can see a lot of like uh, articles on Google Reader. So my Google Reader was kind of flooded by Bitcoin topics around the Christmas of 2009. So that's the first time I, I came across uh, Bitcoin. And I still remember that I, I was using a ThinkPad X200 laptop at that time. And I also calculated that whether my small laptop can do mining and other stuff, but yeah, but I didn't, I didn't do that. That was a pity. Oh, man, and yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I, I, at that time, I think it's, it was really, really cool, but uh, I didn't think that uh, the consensus can be reached. So that's the problem I see at that time. And um, uh, then I dropped it a little bit. So I, I, didn't, I didn't do anything related to Bitcoin after that. Uh, and then things come to 2013. At that time, I started my first startup in Shanghai. And uh, my two partners are both from Stanford University. So they remind me that they, they were saying that because they, they keep the, they're keeping an eye on the, on the most the front end, on most edging tech stuff uh, in the US. So they remind mm -hmm. that you should, you should check out Bitcoin again. So, I just check it out and I, I, I can feel that the consensus was reached. So that's the first time I bought Bitcoin in 2013. Interesting, uh, but okay. My, yeah, but my career didn't get into Bitcoin until uh, 2017. Previously, I was working for a drone company and uh, mostly we were targeting uh, the US market and the Europe market. So we were selling the product globally and also like we pitched a lot of like really, really good uh, influencers like uh, Casey Nestat in the States. So yeah, it was a really success. And we got our product into Apple store also over 400 Apple stores around the world. Oh, wow. uh, and, and then my previous company got invested from Snapchat. So, and then I quit that company because I was in Beijing and my wife was pregnant. So I came back to Shanghai. And after my, my, my son was born in uh, early 2018, um, I was looking for a new opportunity. And uh, then Discuss Fish came to me because he founded Kobo uh, around like uh, August in 2017. And uh, they, they, they were doing software wallet, centralized software wallet of Kobo mm -hmm. wallet. And uh, they thought that there is a huge opportunity for hardware and uh, their investor was my uh, classmate in university. So they came mm. to me and uh, uh, it, it, it was very lucky that I have some knowledge about Bitcoin and I was a early investor. And also I have ability of making hardware and also uh, introducing the hardware into the Western market. You know that the Western market and China market, you've been in China. So you know that the marketing stuff are totally different between these two markets. So mm -hmm. it was very lucky that I have all these experiences. So then I joined Kobo, uh, being the head of hardware of Kobo and uh, making the Kobo vault. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much my story. Yeah, interesting. So you, you have the kind of experience of, uh, you know, using Bitcoin 
from 2013, uh, you know, yeah. through, uh, through 2018 and, you know, custodying your own Bitcoin, talking to friends about how they're doing it uh, and whatnot. Yeah. And then the hardware experience of, of the drone company getting uh, products to market in the U.S. around the world. Um, so yep. that's an interesting kind of confluence of experience to uh, take mm -hmm. to Kobo. Uh, and so yep. Discus Fish, also kind of a big name in the industry, uh, Kobo and F2 Pool. Um, yep. And uh, uh, so, you know, you all, you all get connected, you join Kobo. And the goal is initially is, hey, we're going to build um, some hardware and we're going to roll out a vault service. Uh, maybe take us through... Uh, Kind of the progression of how the product was thought about from when you joined to now um, and how discus fish is thinking about it and also just give us an overview uh, of the business today the products that uh, you all uh, have rolled out uh, as of okay. now okay uh, so when we were designing the product the first generation of product we were mainly targeting some uh, the miners in China because Discus Fish was really well connected in the mm -hmm. Chinese mining community, and uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the mining industry here. All the mining farms, uh, they are chasing the cheapest electricity, so they have to go to the most isolated places in China, like Xinjiang, like Sichuan. So. Oh. Uh, they are, they have strong wind. They have the cheapest wind electricity or water electricity. Uh, mm -hmm. But the but the situation there was really tough. Like strong wind and uh, uh, a lot of a lot of raining. This kind of stuff. It's so, not a glamorous first, uh, a glamorous job being out there in the wilderness. Yeah, 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 sure. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. So uh, we interviewed a lot of miners at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all think that they need something very tough. They need some power really, really tough because they have used the ledger and the treasure before. In that like tough situations or scenarios, uh, the hardware won't last very long at that scenario. So uh, first thing, they want something really tough. And that's why for our first generation, it's built by aluminum. And also it has waterproof and a drop resistance, this kind of uh, features and it also mm -hmm. passed the 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 uh, military standard of A10G in the United States. Uh, that's the first thing we brought to the community: uh, the toughness of the hardware wallet. The second thing we interviewed the uh, we interviewed the the miners. Uh, I asked them one very interesting country, uh, one very interesting question, which is, uh, when is the most anxious time when you are using Ledger or Trezor? Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, okay. it's very like uh, almost all of them told me that the most anxious time is when they plug the hardware wallet into their laptop. That's the most like frightening time they have. So, and that's why we, we decided to build a more air gapped device for them. And that's mm -hmm. why we came to the idea that we should use QR code to interact between your code storage and your uh, software wallet. Mm -hmm. So, because the QR code, uh, it's all transparent and you can audit every data in and out of your hardware device. So, and then they can feel more safe for their like, like tens or hundreds of Bitcoins. So that's the second thing. And then we build the first generation of Cobalt Vault. But unfortunately, the price was really high. It, in the States, it's around uh, 400 to 500 bucks. So uh so it didn't sell very well uh, outside of the mining industry here in china uh, and then in 2019 i went to a bitcoin conference in san francisco bitcoin 2019 i was there and uh, the very interesting thing was that i interviewed a lot of like normal like daily hodlers there in san francisco uh, one question i asked, asked them was that do you really, that's the first time I talked to like very average Bitcoiners in the States. Uh, the most critical question I talked to them was, uh, do you care features like waterproof and a drop resistant? They told me that they care those features, but according to how, how many Bitcoins they have, they really would, because they see that like uh, their home got flooded by, by a broken pipe or something. They, they, they feel that there's very little possibility for that. 
they told me that if that happens, I just spend another hundred bucks to buy another hardware wallet, then it's solved. Yeah, so, and then I came back to China with that insight. So for the second generation, we remove all the waterproof, all the, all the toughness features, and, uh, but we still took the see of the QR code to make it more air gapped. And uh, the most critical thing is that we make it much, much cheaper. So we have two versions, 99 bucks and 149 bucks. But we took the legacy of QR code and also we make it more uh, open source. For the first generation, we didn't put too much work on open source because if you do open source, you need to do a lot of work, not simply just post the code on GitHub. You need to do code review. You need to do everything to prepare the whole thing because being open source, you're open to good people. You're also open to hackers. So you really need to do a lot of work around that to make your code open. So for the second generation, we we open every single piece of code we wrote, including the firmware of the secure element. So that's also aligns our uh, like product design principle, which is bringing more transparency to the community. Yeah. Uh, and you know the uh, some of the some of your uh, kind of earlier counterparts in, in the hardware space have had a kind of a long-standing debate over what's better, open source or closed source, in terms of Trezor and Ledger going back and forth. Um, and that's yeah. that's really interesting to hear your uh, you know how y'all started with miners um, and built a product specifically for them, and then you're um, kind of doing research along the way. Uh, figuring figuring out uh, you know better ways to reach kind of the more retail uh, broad audience. Uh, do you find that your miners are still wanting uh, you know your mining customers around China and elsewhere are still wanting uh, the more durable uh, devices of kind of that first generation? Yes, yes, definitely. And also after we launched the second generation in the United States, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of Bitcoiners in the United States came to me that they want the, the first generation, which is Copa Vault Ultimate. But unfortunately, we currently, we don't have enough resources to build these two product lines together. So maybe later when we have a stronger team, we will relaunch the, 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 uh, the first generation, which is Copa Vault Ultimate. Uh, for the user experience side, they're mostly the same. They all have four inch touch screen, uh, which is also because we believe that, uh, because also I think you also know that human error is the biggest reason for Bitcoin loss. So we believe that user experience is really, really important to give people a more robust uh, self custody situation. So. Uh, the four inch touchscreen are the same, the QR code are the same. So yeah, it's not very hard for us to restart that product line, but we need to uh, wait a little bit for our team to be stronger. And also maybe wait a little bit for the price to go up a little bit. More resources to, to spend on the team. Uh, so yeah. uh, uh, air gaps, open source, uh, kind of two, two of the, um, kind of key decisions that you've made for this, these next generations. Um, yeah. And, and also uh, user experience. And also user experience. With the, uh, the, the uh, digital screen. And uh, so the, the team that kind of you're over, this hardware team, uh, can you kind of lay out uh, Kobo as an organization more broadly also? Uh, so we have a picture of uh, uh, the company overall and how the hardware piece okay. sits in the company. Okay. Okay, uh, actually, uh, there are three product lines in Kobo. The first is Kobo Wallet. The second is Kobo Custody. The third is Kobo Vault. For Kobo Wallet and the Kobo Custody, they are both centralized services. Uh, because you know, in China, also in Asia market, there are more traders here. They are more used to centralize the services. They think that those services are more convenient they are not like Westerners. They are not like Bitcoiners in the States. They, they do self-custody. So very few people here in Asia do self-custody. That's why we have a centralized, we have centralized Kobo wallet, mostly for the Asian users. And for that product, we, uh, it's just like using a exchange and uh, with, with more features, you can easily buy in some financial services for your Bitcoin. Like I think currently we're having a 5% to 6% growth every year if you 
put your Bitcoin in Cobalt Wallet and buy in the financial services there. Uh, that's for Cobalt Wallet. And uh, Cobalt Custody is, uh, is the centralized custody solution for enterprise users. Uh, for example, uh, it's like a, uh, the, the fundamental layer for the wallet services for exchanges. A lot of exchanges in Asian market, I think around the, uh, 200 exchanges, those are the, uh, the second tier or the third tier exchanges. They're using our Cobalt Custody services here in Asian market. So they don't need to build their wallet. They just use our Cobalt Custody service and build, build, the, build the upper layer exchange applications above our wallet uh, layer. So that's the biggest, uh, that's also part of the big business here in, in Cobalt. And also the Cobalt Custody also offer the services of just uh, like BitGo and uh, Coinbase, just normal custody services for enterprise users. If you just want to simply put your Bitcoin into somewhere which is really safe. And uh, that is for Cobalt Custody. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, currently Cobalt Custody is the number one custodian services for enterprise here in Asian market. And for Cobalt Wallet, it is also one of the biggest custodial services in China. Yes. Interesting. And the progression of the company from um, kind of you know, pool, working with a lot of miners, uh, centralized yep. uh, wallet, um, uh, hardware wallet, uh, more enterprise kind of centralized wallet services uh, makes a lot of mm -hmm. sense. The financial services yep. around that uh, yep. centralized wallet product. Um, you yes. know, and staying all yeah. over the place with centralized wallets. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Yes. And also, uh, inside of Cobol, Cobol, we use Cobol Vault as the fundamental layer of the, uh, the Bitcoin uh, storage solution here in Cobol. And also with some uh, our enterprise services, if they want to use like multi-signature for Bitcoin, we also have Cobol Vault for them because Cobol Custody also offer a services of uh, multi-signature for the enterprise users. So Cobalt Vault is like the very basic layer here for security and the Cobalt Wallet and the Cobalt Custody kind of take that advantage of our own hardware wallet to build the services also for people here in China and also the enterprise who are used to centralize the services. It's real skin in the game when uh, you're, you're using uh, your own hardware product as the backbone of uh, your uh, mm -hmm. Of the security of the business, so makes sense. Um, yeah. And uh, and uh, so when we when we you know you you kind of mentioned that uh, that enterprise service is you know one of the uh, mm -hmm. if not, you know it's one of the most uh, used in Asia. Um, can you speak at all to the differences of what uh, uh, kind of is necessary for an exchange or you know a larger money manager in Asia to use uh, a custody service versus what's required in the US. Um, obviously there are uh, uh, kind of legal things in the US that require a certain level of um, uh, a certain level of uh, of, uh, of uh, licensing and whatnot. Uh, and so you do have a couple of players with a majority of the market share there. Uh, is, it the, is it the same over in China and, and other countries in, uh, out in Asia that you all uh, work with? Uh, who kind of manages that process of, um, you know, regulatory, regulatory wise, what's necessary in each place? Uh, okay, so uh, uh, let, me, let me repeat your question uh, in case I misunderstand, uh, in case I misunderstand anything. Uh, you were asking something about the regulation here for the custom services in Asian market, right? Uh, okay, I see. Uh, I think for the for the compliance and the regulation stuff, uh, here in China, it's quite immature. It's unlike the states, you have a lot of licenses and you have very relatively mature system to do the compliance and the regulation there. Here in China, we mostly uh, compliance with uh, Hong Kong rules or Singapore rules. So. Uh, we have a compliance team here in Kobo and the mostly the first thing we do is like the sanction because the sanction applies to all the companies around the world 
uh, like we cannot uh, do business with uh, companies from Iran, this kind of thing. And also then for the licensing and the regulation part, we mostly align with Hong Kong market and the Singapore market. I think those two markets are the most advanced and the most mature uh, markets here in, in Asia. And uh, most of the Asia, when we, when we were pitching the Cobalt Custody clients, most of them came to us asking, do you have a license in Hong Kong or Singapore? I think that's the mostly the, the, the compliance stuff we were working on currently. Um, and uh, for that team that's been kind of onboarding those inner kind of institutions, enterprise uh, users, uh, can you speak at all to kind of the growth and interest since this uh, bull run has essentially started in the last six months or so? Uh, what are you seeing uh, in terms of inbound, in terms of, uh, um, you know, players wanting something that's more enterprise grade for storage? Okay. Uh, you Sorry, you are asking about the self custody part, or you are asking about the custodial part? Enterprise, uh, the enterprise offering. Uh, how much of an? Uh, can you speak at all to the uh, demand? Any change in demand that you've seen as this year has progressed with Bitcoin? Uh, you know, going up in price and getting more attention. Uh, we've, okay. There's been a lot, there's been a lot of uh, you know uh, attention given to. Uh, big investors and asset managers and people uh, around here getting into the space mm -hmm. um, and how they're custodying their Bitcoin. So you look at like a micro strategy um, or a, a square that has, you know, who have both published white papers about how they bought and uh, custody the Bitcoin. Uh, has, have you seen an uptick in demand uh, in Asia from those enterprise type clients uh, at all? Okay. Uh, I think in the Asian market, uh, the first thing I saw is uh, previously the tech companies, they were only in centralized services like Cobalt Custody. Uh, but currently, a lot of uh, tech companies, uh, they are finding some, they are trying to reach to some diversity for storing Bitcoin. So they're also using decentralized services. They are also getting into multi-signature to build their own system to do their self custody for their Bitcoin. That's the big trend I see here in China. Uh, I think you also know that, uh, I think it's around two weeks ago or three weeks, just three weeks ago, uh, the OKEX, uh, their founder uh, like was, was engaged into some kind of uh, bad situation and uh, all the withdrawal of uh, OKEX was held by them. So that was a big trigger here in China for people to, to, to look for self custody solutions. Um, but, but again, most people here, they, they use custodial services, not only for, you know, for personal users, but also for enterprises. Yeah. Uh, I, and I, you know, the, the micro strategies of the world, the, uh, you know, bigger folks here who are regulated have to use yep. custodial services centralized um, based on yep. some of those re re regulatory, regulatory stuff we touched on. Uh, while mm -hmm. there, it's a little bit less um, less regulated at this point, they have an opportunity to move to self-custody, multi-signature stuff on their own if they want to. That's interesting. You've seen a trend towards yep. that. And OK, mm -hmm. the OKX um, uh, you know, situation was a uh, well-publicized catalyst is, is interesting. Um, and I don't know if you saw this today, but uh, I think Brian Armstrong, uh, Coinbase uh, CEO, tweeted mm. out that he had been hearing rumors that the current administration in the U.S. Um, with Mnuchin as Treasury Secretary uh, may be trying to pass um, some type of law regulation uh, that um, will hinder or ban uh, self-custody of Bitcoin and crypto. Uh, and so he, he kind of tweeted out a whole thread about um, you know, what they're hearing and why he would be, you know, against some type of regulation like that, obviously. Uh, so, you know, things may, be, may just be getting more uh, strict in the U.S., at least in terms of sentiment from the powers that be. Um, do you see that as a risk at all in uh, China in the near term? Uh, if it's a little bit more free now in terms of being able to do, to do self-custody, uh, do you see the government uh, coming in and acting uh, in any way in the future against self-custody 
um, will a rollout of kind of the central bank digital currency play into that at all? Do you think uh, any thoughts on that? I guess. Mm, I think uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that will happen in the in the future uh, because uh, if everything come to centralized, then the system may be broken. I think that's also not the thing that the government won't say because Bitcoin is is definitely becoming more and more. So it's like the question that people asking me will Chinese will Chinese government ban Bitcoin, totally ban Bitcoin. I said it's impossible for Chinese government to do that because Bitcoin is a industry you cannot ignore here in China. It's solving a lot of like, it's offering a lot of job opportunities in the most isolated places in China. You know that in areas like Sichuan, there's no other industry. In the mountains, there's very resourceful, cheap electricity there. And the Bitcoin industry is helping those places to solve their problems. Otherwise, those places don't have any income. So for Chinese government, Chinese government is really, really practical. They just want to build the economy better. That's their first thing. And the second thing is to keep the society more stable. That's the biggest two things for Chinese government. You have been here in China. So they don't care too much about the uh, political things. They care, they care about stableness and also the economy. So here in China, uh, the government is like, okay, if you don't get Bitcoin into our own ec economic system, which means that's why Chinese government doesn't allow uh, inbound and outbound of Bitcoin here with B. but Chinese government allows the mining industry. Some, even some isolated government like Sichuan government, they encourage mining industry here because it's helping them to solve economy problems. So, uh, I'm not sure because I was not born in the United States. I'm not sure about the United States, the government of the United States, but the government of China is definitely want to crack the whole thing because it's benefiting from Bitcoin industry. It's really practical here. Yes. That also makes a lot of sense. And uh, mm -hmm. this is just based off of a, a tweet thread from Brian Armstrong. So no uh, concrete yeah. uh, you know, action or anything by the government here yet something that people are starting to think about earlier than I probably would have expected. Um, but right, uh, you know, globally, uh, globally, it's impossible to ban Bitcoin or force, uh, you know, really force people to not self-custody. Um, yes. the, uh, the hardware multi-sig kind of products that you all have, um, are miners able to self-custody um, and also kind of access the financial services of the centralized wallet? or it's kind of one or the other? Yes, I think both. Currently, the miners, they're looking for some diversity. Previously, just used hardware wallet, but currently they're also using uh, financial services like borrowing and lending Bitcoin, because when they see the price goes up, they don't want to sell the Bitcoin. They, they, they borrow some fiat with their Bitcoin to pay for the electricity and other stuff. So the miners here, they're, they're the most advanced people here in China. So they're not only doing self custody and also using all kinds of financial services here. Yeah. And uh, there are some very big companies like Baybell here in China, which is really, they, they mostly focus on, they started from the financial services for the miners. Yeah, like lending and borrowing for fiat, this kind of thing. So it's really big here. Uh, uh, I don't know if, how much more you can speak to, you know, customers of the, uh, the vault and um, the, uh, you know, custodial services that you offer, but any, any uh, uh, you know, is it, is it safe to assume that most of the bigger kind of financial services companies, the Babel is not necessarily Babel, but these other uh, uh, companies are using uh, Kobo or is um, there a, a diversification between Western based uh uh, custody providers um, and you all and other competitors, uh, I guess, uh, kind of how much of a market share do you think that uh, you all have in Asia of uh, not just those kind of secondary type of exchanges, but the, you know, top uh, kind of tier of Bitcoin companies? 
Okay. Uh, I think most miners here in China, uh, they don't use they don't use Western services. They don't use services like BitGo and Coinbase uh, in the States because the language and the culture and the time difference, I think there are three biggest gaps for people here to using those services. Uh, because uh, for the customer service, it's like a financial service. So customer service is a very, very important part for offering those kind of services. So the miners here, they cannot help them out, help themselves out. So they need to contact the, the customer service here. If Big O and uh, Coinbase, they have uh, companies here in China and uh, they, offer very, they offer very localized services here in China. Otherwise, miners here, they mostly use uh, customer services like Kobo and also they will put money into companies like Baybell Finance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and kind of vice versa, I guess. Uh, you all's um, kind of expansion uh, to uh, you know reach the West with your products. Um, yeah. Uh, speak, can you speak to that a little bit, and then also touch on uh, you know there's uh, you know in terms of kind of the public perception of uh, the relationship between China and the U.S. Uh, you know there's there's been a lot of um, uh, you know there have been some essentially uh, like fake news stories about. Uh, uh, I remember a, a Bloomberg piece about chips manufactured in, in China that um, Bloomberg was claiming um, were, uh, you know, had a backdoor in them, which there's no evidence for. Uh, essentially, just kind of a broader mistrust um, for Chinese technology products from Huawei to whatever. Um, uh, you know, do you see that? Uh, do you see any of those questions at all when you talk to um, kind of bigger Western customers? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you can walk through the process of manufacturing and all these things. Uh, but how, how big of an issue has that been for y'all? And if you just talk, speak to that, uh, uh, you know, uh, situation at least. Okay, I think for for that topic, uh, I I was always saying that uh, for Bitcoiners, we should not be manipulated by the political uh, views or by the political people. We should have our own thinking. For example, uh, I think the. For us, it's kind of like an issue or a problem we need to solve. To solve this problem, the most thing we do is transparency. So we cannot take off the, 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 the label from us that we're from China, but we can be more and more transparency. We can do open source and we can do open to any kind of critical issues or critical uh, criticizes if people have for us. So that's the first thing we do. The second thing we do is we are really a huge embracer for the multi-signature. So I think for the Bitcoiners, if you're really paranoid, you should not trust the one vendor. You should trust you should trust the three or four vendors in a combination for your multi-signature setup. So, and that's why uh, people actually it come back to a very early story that, uh, that Discuss Fish asked me that, why didn't you just fork Trezor to build a hardware wallet with QR code recognition and everything? That will make, make it much easier for you and also make it much easier for the manufacturing, for the development. And also you will get into the ecosystem quicker because Trezor has all the other stuff support and you just fork Trezor. But I said that if we live in a building that if we live in a building that is have the same base with other buildings, you are in the same situation of the risk. So we need to build some totally different from that building, even with the base. So a totally new building will make you easier to, to be away from the risks that the previous model has. So that's, I told him that we should have more diversity because the whole thing is about decentralized. I think the biggest thing about decentralization is it's avoiding single point failure. If all your hardware was, if our hardware fuck from Trezor, it's kind of single point failure because you are building it, you're building something from the same base that others have. So I think the whole thing is about decentralization. The whole thing is about avoid the single point failure. And that's why we, we like 
we promoting we were promoting multi signature very very hard and also we're trying to be as transparent as possible to we don't want to remove the the label from us we are chinese we are from china but we can do everything else we're trying to do everything else and also i think bitcoiners should not be manipulated by those political viewers because they have their interest to to promote those ideas i think yeah you know, I think on balance, I would say that the Bitcoiners I know are less less manipulatable than. Uh, yes, um, yes, definitely. By, uh, government and media, um, and yes. that's a refreshing answer that you gave to Discus Fish on, uh, you know, essentially a way to strengthen uh, security in Bitcoin overall um, by diversifying mm -hmm. the, um, uh, you know, ground up approaches to hardware wallets specifically. Yes, um, yes. That makes sense. Um, so you you spent a couple of years. Uh, you know, rolling out your first product, iterating on that to develop a better second product, um, and you know, going to market. Uh, you know, your your uh, Kobo is going to market with uh, you know other product lines uh, as well as we've talked about. Uh, I guess uh, can you talk about what you uh, kind of what's next? What do you see as being the next frontier of um, security in Bitcoin, and how Kobo is thinking about that? Uh, maybe specifically for the, the hardware wallet, and then um, you know, if there's a broader vision for Kobo overall, uh, just okay. take to the next years. Okay, I think uh, from my side because I'm putting all my time on Kobo Vault, so I don't get engaged into the like, custom services or Kobo. So for hardware wallet, uh, what I can see is that I think hardware wallet may play a bigger role, not only in Bitcoin community, but also in the security, the whole security model for the internet. For example, I'm thinking that maybe one day everyone will have a hardware wallet to do, uh, the, 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 to do the second factor for authentication. Maybe when you're logging to your Twitter or something, you need to do a hardware wallet to do kind of authentication to finish that. It's kind of like a personal personal security device because your phone will always get connected to internet and it's not so simplified to meet those kind of security situations. So the first thing I see is that, the first thing I'm seeing is that Howard World will be a very strong personal security device for your internet services. That's the first thing. The second thing I'm seeing maybe in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, maybe if just like the, I'm not sure if you're a big fan of the TV series of Black Mirror, in that they, they envision a future that most of our life are virtual. Most of our life happens on internet. So if that day comes, I think the how it works may be your personal ID. It can be your personal ID on, in the virtual world. That's the thing I see for the future of how it works. So, and that's why I put most of the most of the time on Howard Wood. I don't get into centralized services. I have a strong belief for Howard Wood playing a bigger role for everyone around the world. Yes. That's a good vision. Uh, and, and kind of with a vision like that, uh, as we move forward, uh, obviously you're a proponent of more, uh, more diversification of uh, in terms of competitors in the hardware wallet space. Um, how much uh, interaction do you have with some of your counterparts? Uh, do do uh, you know? Do you talk with the folks at Trezor, folks at Coldcard? Uh, what's what's kind of the community of hardware wallets like communication wise? Mm -hmm. So actually, myself personally, myself is a Bitcoiner. So uh, mostly, I talk to NVK. I talk to Coldcard guys uh, because I think they they focus more on Bitcoin. And uh, they also have a, the best, I think the best security model currently in the world. And also we align a lot of strategies with them. For example, uh, PSBT, for example, multi-signature. So I mostly talk to, to MVK uh, about code card development and also some cooperation. Yes, that's the thing I do here. Bitcoin first, uh, love, love to hear that. Uh, and you know, so just something that's going to be super important for everyone to, um, you know, be aware of and take a, some personal ownership in, in terms of uh, securing their own Bitcoin, 
uh, multi-sig diversification of, of hardware wallets is your, uh, yeah. you know, something that you have mentioned here. Um, so, you know, love your whole perspective on this and, uh, uh, you know, fun, fun to, fun to uh, talk through some of this and how you think about it. Uh, you know, uh, to get a Kobo vault uh, now, uh, can you kind of tell people uh, the best way to do that? Um, I know you'll have a deal for Bitcoin Black Friday through Cyber Monday. Uh, maybe touch on that yes. and, and kind of let people know uh, how they can yeah. uh, make Kobo one of their uh, hardware uh, security devices. Okay, so currently we are cooperating with Bitcoin Magazine uh, to offer a Black Friday deal for all the users. Uh, we started from November the 20th and we were lasted to November the 30th as the Cyber Monday. So uh, if you want a couple vault, if you want to get into, get into self-custody, you can check it out. And uh, our website was kobo.com slash hardware, hardware wallet, hardware dash wallet. Uh, so uh, please remember that we have three product lines in Kobo and don't get confused and don't get <laughs> into the centralized services. We have a couple of out there, click the tab of couple, couple of out. And also if you want to know more, if you want to know more background stories uh, about couple vault and the, the features, the detail of the features and why we build these features, you can go to our medium page and we have a lot of articles there. For example, our design principles and uh, a, a deep dive into the QR code. And also we're offering features like dice rolling to create your own entropy. And recently we also launched a feature of Shamir backup, just like Trezor. Uh, but unlike Trezor, we also share a lot of knowledges about uh, the downside of Shamir backup. So uh, again, I uh, previously in another podcast, I was saying that uh, hardware wallet is not your silver bullet for your security, but knowledge is your silver bullet. So you need to, you know, you'd better read those articles and you'd better get equipped with knowledge to protect your orange coin. That's my point. And uh, yeah, that's really important. Yeah. Uh, and, and to follow you specifically, are, are you, uh, uh, how can people follow you? Twitter, WeChat to reach out? Okay, Twitter. Uh, my Twitter is Bitcoin Li Xing. Uh, Bitcoin, L-I-X-I-N, and you can find me there. And uh, I will check every DM. So if you have any questions for product for me, or if you're looking for some partnership, just come to my Twitter. And uh, the Cobalt Vault Twitter is just simply Cobalt Vault. And uh, you can see a lot of stuff there. Yeah. And, uh, we, we close that actually with uh, more of a fun question. Uh, you're out of Shanghai, you spent time in Beijing. Uh, just one recommendation for post-COVID life when people are traveling again uh, or maybe okay. remote. What's one recommendation for Shanghai maybe uh, for people uh, who may be visiting in the future? Okay, so for Shanghai, I'm a Shanghai niece. So uh, I think if you come to Shanghai, the, the thing you must have is the Shanghai dumplings. It's really nice. I have it every week. Yeah, it's really good. You should take that. And for Shanghai, you can enjoy the nightlife here and around the, the bond, there are a lot of really good bars and uh, you can have all kinds of good food there. I'm a foodie. So yeah, that's the most thing I want to recommend. All of that uh, as a uh, part, partly a Shanghai expat uh, myself. And, uh, you know, as a foodie, you're, you're, looking, you're in great shape over there, staying trim. So uh, mm -hmm. uh Maybe we should take your specific uh, recommendations to, to heart there. Uh, well, thanks for the mm -hmm. time and uh, get to connect and um, hopefully see you in person at, at Bitcoin 2021 uh, in LA. Yeah.